Stanley, who was the British Council's English for Education Systems Lead for the Americas. Um, his books include Remote Teaching, um, British Council 2019, Language Learning with Technology, published by Cambridge University Press in 2013, and Digital Play, Computer Games and Language um, Aims, Delta Publishing 2011. Graham is also the newsletter editor for the IATFL LT SIG. Um, during Graham's session, you can watch, we recommend speaker view, and if you have any questions, just as in the other sessions, please type them in the Q&A box and then Graham will answer them after his talk. Over to you, Graham. You can share your screen, screen um, with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for that uh, introduction. And hello, everybody. Um, now, today I'll be talking about designing escape room games for English language teaching, specifically for secondary students. Uh, but it, escape room games can clearly be used with other um, other ages as well. Now, I think escape room games are effective ways of, in particular, motivating secondary learners to practice listening and speaking uh, skills. You can turn your classroom, your physical classroom, into an escape room uh, game or design activities that can be used online. And today I'll be talking a little bit about both, although I think, you know, these days the idea of of making it online only is um, something that is very popular, of course, because of the school's closures. But it is possible to do hybrid as well, I think. Um, although I only have half an hour, so it's very difficult to talk about all of this. Right, so first of all, um, I think for those of you who don't really know what an escape room game is, it's an adventure game. It's set within a confined space in which uh, players solve puzzles to unlock a door and, as you guessed, escape a room or a series of rooms. Now, online escape room games, I think, lend themselves particularly to language teaching. And you can include elements of interactive storytelling and role playing. Um, and I'm going to look today at two examples, one for beginners or elementary students, and another one for uh, students that are um, at a more upper intermediate level or advanced, etc. And then I'll be looking at uh, what I think is a good framework for any teachers who want to design their own escape room games um learn from my mistakes if you like so i think um the first game i'm going to look at i've called trapped it's an escape room game for beginners it's a simple escape room game um and clearly there's not much of a story uh, to this game and it's meant to be a fun way for students to practice directions. You start by having a template, which is the, um, the diagram that you can see on the right. And basically there are a number of rooms represented by the squares and a number of one-way doors represented by the smaller squares with the arrows. And the idea is that uh, you describe the room to the students and then they decide what they want to do. Uh, move uh, straight ahead or go through the door on the right, et cetera. So there's a limited amount of, of language that the students actually need to be able to do that. Now, I've also written a, um, a script which you can use with the students. And this is basically the instructions of what they would need to do to be able to get out of the room. Uh, so you can use this in various ways. And the idea would be that after you've done this activity with all of the students, as an example, you can share this script and they can then follow it to see, uh, you know, how to escape the room. And then they can also um, design their own game using a template and play in pairs or the students could 
um, could do it for the, the rest of the class, depending on how you set it up. Now, this is something that I think you can use as an online activity, or you could do in the classroom. Um, it would lend itself to both. That's an example of a very, very simple escape room game for beginners. I'm going to move on to something a bit more um, meaty, if you like, or a bit more complicated. And this is called Escape the Family Dinner Party. This is um, a live listening, interactive story, role playing game designed to encourage speaking um, with secondary school students. And I think the idea here is that, again, it could be played in a classroom or online, or um, if you have a hybrid situation with some students online at home um, and others in the classroom, you could also use it in that way as well. Now, to play, you describe the scenario, and then you start asking questions to the students. You can split the students into groups. They could play different family members. Um, um, or if you have a smaller group of students, then they could each uh, just act as individuals. But I think uh, it, it's quite a flexible um, game. Now, I think the game should take around 20 to 30 minutes to play, and then you can do follow up activities. You could make it more um, detailed if you want. You it could be longer. And if you want the students to have a bit more background, you can do that. The scenario is, this is what you tell the students, that every year your uncle Bacco and Aunt Camilla hold a dinner party to celebrate your cousin David's birthday. Now, all of David's cousins are invited, and this is these are the roles that the students play, either in groups or individually. And along with Grandpa Philip and Grandpa Mary, you tell the students that you don't particularly like your cousin David, but you have promised your parents that you go and you've accepted the invitation. On the day of the dinner party, a surprise announcement is made about a very special event happening in the town hall at 10 p.m. that night. And here you can have the students decide what it is. Um, there's a limited space in the town hall, so you will all need to leave the dinner party by 9 p.m. in order to get there by time. Then you tell the students that unfortunately past experience tells you that these dinner parties usually go on late and they don't finish until 11 p.m. Why? Because the food is usually served late and because David and his family love to play board games after dinner. This time you have to make excuses and make sure you leave at 9 p.m. So that's the scenario. And it's suggested that the students might want to arrive early so they can help with the food to make sure that it isn't delayed, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, it's up to you, but I would suggest uh, or next um, brainstorming, elicitate, eliciting the, um, the language that the students may want to use here. The focus of this particular game is on small talk and apologizing and making excuses. There is an element which you may want to include or not, which would in, in, in include reported speech, practice of reported speech, which I'll come to in a minute, which you can include as well. Um, I think once the students have uh, elicited the language or you've brainstormed it together, you can actually give some of the, uh, the language. Here's an example of that. Uh, if you want to make it an element of the game of giving points to the students for using that language, that's another thing you can do if you want, but it's not necessary. It's up to you how your class works. You know your learners. And then you start the game. Now, before you set off for the dinner, the students will obviously have to decide what kind of present they want to buy David. And you tell uh, the students that David has just started uh, studying um, at university. I suggest uh, in my notes that he just started studying law. So the students could decide to club together or individually buy him a book about law or something um, related to him going to university to study. Or we said before that he's very, he's a fan of board games. So you could buy him a board game, etc. And then you go off to the party. Um, just before you go to the party, your mother gives you some advice. And the advice is that, you know, um, please be kind and respectful to everyone. Um, don't upset anyone. Remember that um, Aunt Camilla is the cook 
in the in the house and it's suggested that the students might want to go and um, the cousins might want to go and help Aunt Camilla with the food. Um, then it's remind they're reminded that Uncle Baco tells dreadful jokes, but they should humour him and laugh at the jokes. That Grandpa Philip tends to waffle and tell lots of strange stories, and these stories are usually embarrassing. So they sh he should be interrupted before he's allowed to sort of embarrass anyone. And Grandpa Mary is hard of hearing. So you should be aware of that and you should be patient and prepared to, um, to repeat some of the questions and some of the answers. And that's where the reported speech comes in. So the next thing that happens is the game starts. Oops, excuse me. The game starts and... Um, you go through the times and at various times, as the time changes, different things happen. So the students are arri arrive at the house, they're greeted by Aunt Camilla, Aunt Camilla uh, asks them to take a seat while she goes and prepares the food. That's when the students can offer to help her with the food, uh, the small talk in the kitchen while that is happening. Then they go through to the dining room, Uncle Baco comes in, he tells a very dreadful joke. The students have to react to that. Um, there's a lot of more small talk involved in there. The students are asked if they want to tell a joke, so they get the opportunity to tell a joke in English. Um, then Grandpa Philip turns up and they have to remember to interrupt him so he doesn't embarrass everyone with their story. Then Grandpa Mary turns up and she asks about the students, their lives, and there's a lot of socializing going on. That's where the report and speech comes in. And then finally, Cousin David comes, comes to, the, to the table and the meal starts. Um, they can give the present to Cousin David or wait until after the meal. They can start asking. Cousin David actually um, reveals to the students that he's dropped out of university, so he's no longer studying law. So that's where they would have to apologize for buying him something related to law, a book or whatever, um, that they didn't know that, and that maybe they can get a refund, etc. If they give him a board game, then Cousin David will probably reveal that he's already got the board game, so they would have to apologize again, et cetera, et cetera. The meal goes on, dessert is served. After dessert, it gets to nine o'clock and they have to make their excuses to leave. And that's the way the, the, the game develops. And you can really sort of play to the level of the students and get them to suggest the language, taking notes uh, as you go along about any errors to deal with after the game. And the idea is that if they come up with a plausible excuse, then the excuse is accepted and they're allowed to leave. If they don't come up with a plausible excuse, then they can be pushed back from the, um, from the family and, uh, and resulting awkwardness, if you like. That's the game. So that's the two games that I've, um, that I've planned and wanted to present very quickly, I'm sure. I'm sorry, I hope that makes sense, but we don't have a lot of time. The next uh, thing I'll be talking about is this idea of what I've been using as a framework for designing this type of games for students. And there are six things on this. There are th three things, I think, that the most important things when you approach the design of an escape room game like, like the ones I've showed you. And then um, two sort of checks and then a final thing to do before you unleash it on students. So let's look at these in turn. The first thing is basically learning objectives and language. So I think it's very important to start with the language or the learning objectives. Why are you using an escape room game? Is it the best way of practicing or presenting the language that you want to do? Is it because you want to do something in addition to the book that you're using with students to motivate them? which I think is a valid reason as well. Um, are they a little bit tired and they need something a little bit more uh, different? Is it a way of revising language, of giving them extra practice, et cetera? For me, I think one of the best reasons for using this type of activity is because I believe that if you provide students with memorable learning experiences in the classroom, then it really does help them learn and practice English. If you have something that is interesting, is exciting, or otherwise stimulates the students, and I think they're more likely to learn than if they're just doing, uh, you know, the usual um, 
But I do think that it is very important that before you start doing anything like this, that you really do concentrate on the reasons for doing it and make sure that you have those clear. Next thing I would do once you decide what the language is, is to try and figure out what kind of, you know, what, what the language, uh, what kind of story might fit with that language? What's the situation? What's the context? So in the uh, dinner party game, I want to design something that was all about languages of excuses and small talk. So that scenario of a family dinner um, lend, seemed to lend itself to that for me. And I think the important thing is to get the story in there. Now, you don't have to have a story with an escape room game, but I think it helps. And especially when the escape room game is being used for English language teaching and learning. Um, if you do have a story, then follow up activities are very, very easy. You can have um, all sorts of things uh, like the students writing narratives or letters, etc. They could write a thank you letter after the dinner party game, for example, to the hosts or they could write up their experience as a bit of a story um, to try and remember or to tell their, their mother. You could role play a conversation the next day about with the mother about what happened, et cetera, et cetera. Now I have a, another escape room game called The Missing Mayan Mask where it's all a little bit more sort of out of the ordinary. It's about a dinner party where a valuable object goes missing and there are certain suspects and the players, uh, the students, have to actually um, look at the evidence and decide amongst themselves who they think the, um, the culprit was. And that, the language about that game is all about language of hypothesis, putting forward theories uh, supported by evidence. And because it's not clear cut who stole the actual object, there's a lot of room for discussion and argument, if you like, and people putting forward their theories and counter theories, etc. And that's why I decided that type of story. Right, next I think are puzzles. Um, now they made me hidden clues in text. They could be combination locks to unlock if you have uh, an escape room game that actually uses the physical space of the classroom, then you can do that. If not, you could actually represent them by pictures if you're teaching online. Lots of ways of doing this. When I played this game, the Mayan mask game, in the classroom, I put the mask in a bag, I locked the bag with a lock, the numbers that uh, um, unlock that lock were hidden in texts. So the reading text that students had to examine and, and try out uh, theories. And then the bag was actually hidden in a clock. Um, and that was quite fun because I think this idea of embodied language learning um, works really well if you can do it. Students moving around the classroom space, looking at things, talking to each other in groups, you monitoring, you can help them, you can give them clues, you can uh, do all sorts of things. And I think that's a really good thing. So I think designing the puzzles after you have the story and to make sure that the puzzles um, are complementary to the language is very important. What you have to be very careful about is that the students aren't doing a lot of things related to puzzles that don't involve them in practicing language. So the puzzles can't be that difficult that they spend a lot of time silently trying to solve them. If they're puzzles that require language or that they're discussing uh, together what the possible answers to the puzzles are, then that's valid, I think. But this is very much obviously about the language learning. Um, and so any puzzles you have in place for this type of game needs really to focus upon that. Otherwise, it's doubtful why you should be playing the game. Next. Uh, is the first check. So the first check, I think, is to see whether what you've designed is a disguised text. Now, what I've seen with teachers who adapt, um, who, who create lang uh, their own escape room games is that a lot of them, and a very easy way of doing that, is to take workbook exercises and turn them into games. Um, they kind of bought it on. This is a sort of gamification of you know, you do a, a workbook exercise and 
the teacher rewards you by giving a number. You do three of them and you have three numbers and that open, opens a lock at, in a, to a box on the teacher's desk. For me, that isn't really a game. That is really just a disguised test. Um, and I think, whereas, you know, it might work to make the workbook exercises a bit more fun once or twice, I think really um, the students will get a little bit bored of that. And I don't think it's, um, you calling it a game won't really change things. So I think my preference is not really to overuse that. Um, there may be a time when you think it is worth doing, but I really think you need to look at what you're asking the students to do and make sure they're just not disguised text, tests. Um, because for me, I don't think, I think that sort of kills the fun really. And, and it's not a memorable experience. As I said before, what you should be doing is trying to create a memorable experience for students so that they really do practice, want to practice. Excuse me, Graham, could I stop you for a minute, sure. please? Um, there's someone in the background who's making some noises with plates and cups. Could you please mute your, your microphone if you're that person because it's distracting the audience. Thank you. Okay, sorry. I think that might be my wife who's doing the dishes. Hold on a minute. Oh, oh okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought it was someone from the audience members. I'm sorry about it, Graham. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think it must be that. Um, so, uh, where was I? Right, I'm going to move on uh, to the next check. The next check is the opposite to the other one I've just mentioned. And that is um, what you don't want to do is to design a game that is just a game and doesn't really involve the students in practicing or learning any language. And this actually is, for, is, is easy to do. And you might, um, you might do the class and you might think, oh, they really enjoyed that. That was great. But I think the whole point here is not that the students just have fun. They must have fun and learn or practice language. And it's actually a very easy thing to do to pr present an activity to students that um, involves them in, uh, that is a lot of fun, that involves them doing stuff and playing a game, in particular when you're involving games, but that actually doesn't get them doing any language. The key things there is that, are they talking? Are they thinking? Are they discussing things for themselves? Are they learning anything? Are they reading in English? Are they trying to work things out? Um, if you have students sitting around for 10 minutes um, trying to uh, put together a jigsaw puzzle that has, um, for example, a chord on the back. That's not really very satisfactory, is it? And I've fallen into that trap. So the picture on the slide at the moment shows a very simple jigsaw puzzle that takes, you know, no more than about a minute to do. And then turning it over, the uh, students will get the, the key that the red lock and the number 519. So when they do find a red lock, they know that is the number that um, will open it up. And they're sort of little puzzles that don't take a lot of time, but that um, add a bit of fun to the proceedings, I think. So I think you want to be very careful that you're not just making activity that's just fun. And then the final thing is the play test. Now I've what you can see for my game is like a floor chart of how the elements work together. That, if you are doing an escape room game, designing an escape room game for the classroom is important because you want to make sure that the students find the uh, clues that they're supposed to find first more easily than the other clues. So the mask is really the last thing they want to find. So you want to hide that a bit more, make it a bit more difficult to find. One easy way of doing that is to put it in the teacher's bag, if this is a physical classroom game you're playing, um, et cetera. And I think playing testing is important. So if you can play with colleagues, with friends or family, or if you don't have that opportunity, just do it yourself. Uh, go through the steps as if you were playing the game and make sure that it all makes sense. It's not too difficult, what you're asking of the students. Um, I think it's very important. What you don't want to do is to come up with the activity and without really thinking it through and testing it, unleash it on the students and then for it to go wrong. 
which is actually quite easy for it to happen if you haven't thought carefully through it. And that is my framework. So it's a very simple framework with six steps. Um, hopefully the context of the, the games that I presented at the beginning um, makes it make sense. And now I'm ready for questions, if there are any. Thank you, Graham. Let's see. Um, check the question and answer box. There seem to be a couple of questions. Ah, OK, yes, I can see that now. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention to that. No problem. So, uh, can escape room games work well with large groups of students? Asks so, so Um Yes, but I think you need to think carefully about getting the students into groups. And actually, that can work very well um, with the online version of escape room games, such as the first two examples that I, um, that I presented, especially the dinner party one. That can work quite well because you can have them discussing what their character will do or say before they actually do or say it. Um, so if you add that element of group work to it, it can work. Um, I think I've been answering the, uh, the latest one first. So let me uh, go down. Anna Murray asks for more examples of puzzles that use language. So yeah. Puzzles that use language. I think if you're not using puzzles that use language, then they need to be simple and don't take up a lot of time. Puzzles that use language are sort of ciphers. So you can have coded languages, you can have um, anagrams and stuff. You can have um, something hidden in texts. You could tell the students that if, you know, that a clue could say, if you take the first word from each of the five paragraphs, you will find a sentence that will tell you where the next lock is hidden, etc. Things like that. Um, there are lots of ideas uh, that you can do. Um, can escape room games be designed for one-on-one -on -one classes? Yeah, I don't see why not, Urbish, Urbashi asks. I think you can do it. I think there's more value if the students are, are in a group, I think, because then you actually get the a lot of reasons for um, discussion of the languages, etc. But I think you and one-to-one -one students can actually do something. I think you just need to guide them through, and perhaps you as a teacher would need to role play some of the other parts to make it interesting. Uh, present simple escape room games, grammar escape room games, I think, um, as I said earlier, the lower level, the lower level language learners, I think designing escape room games for lower levels is a challenge. Um, I haven't really been able to come up with many um, examples that are satisfactory because I, at least the kind of thing, escape room games that I think are useful to use with students require some kind of narrative and story to them. So I think it is possible, but it would be very simple and very difficult to actually do. Um, ideal time and escape room activity would last, asks Annabella. Um, well, Annabella, I think, I think you, you know, in an, enter, an escape room game for entertainment, usually you get an hour. I think that's too long for um, an ELT activity. I think, 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes is what you're aiming for. And then depending on how long your class is, you have some time afterwards to, um, to reflect on it, to debrief, to look at the errors, to start thinking about what else you want to do with it. I wouldn't have it go on over two classes. I would do it within one class and allow time to, um, to, to do all those other activities, the follow on activities after the game. Um, that's why you have to be quite um, quite good at making sure you don't design an activity that is is too extensive. Where can you find more about how to design escape room games? Well, actually, there there is a website um, that um, myself and some friends 
other teachers have used to share information. We've done, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an online, um, what's called the TESOL's Electronic Village Online that happens every January, February, every year. And for uh, two years, we've done uh, that and shared with people lots of ideas. So that website, that blog would be the first point of call, I think. There are other teachers that have done stuff. If you just search on it, you'll find lots of things. And then um, I'm hoping next early next year to um, self-publish a book on it as well. Uh, you can see the cover on the uh, thing, but thank you, that's a way off. So many more questions, but I'm afraid the time is up. So thanks okay. a lot. Thank and you. We have a break now and we'll see you back for the next talk. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.